God's stipulated requirements of man demanded those that are created in his image to act upon the will of God, to accept the will of God upon a self-determined basis. But many theologians will tell us that free will on the part of man could compromise the sovereignty of God, that man could say no to his creator. They would have us believe that God arbitrarily selected those whom he would save and our actions have nothing to do with this decision. Well, of course, the sovereignty of God is vindicated in final and irrevocable judgment as Paul sets forth in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, for none can reject God without being punished. But on the other hand, the very nature of God demands nothing less than a moral response to his will. This means a people who of their own will say yes to their maker. Unless we are free to say either yes or no, our love and our praise become the words and actions of mere puppets. They have no real meaning. They have no real moral value. There's no sincerity behind them because we would only have the ability to do what God has commanded us to do. But God wants us to praise him he wants us to worship Him, and He wants us to love Him based upon our free will. We have the ability to determine whether we're going to do this or not. That's a decision each one of us must make. But God wants us to make the decision to worship Him and to love Him. God doesn't want to force us into this, but He wants us to do this because we want to do this. The power of choice also accords with a characteristic of God that's frequently stressed in the scriptures, and that is that God is not a respecter of persons. He treats fairly all those who are created in his image. You know, in, in the Old Testament and the New Testament both, we find passage after passage attesting to this fact. Peter made the statement in Acts 10, verses 34 and 35, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, he who fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. With free will and fairly treated without respect of persons, man becomes one of God's people in the true and moral sense of the term when he fulfills a chief purpose that God had in making man in the first place. Paul wrote, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. Now we propose a simple thesis here that God gave each of us a free moral self and then asks essentially that we give it back to him, that we submit to him. Jesus put it this way, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, Matthew 16, 24. Now we believe God's search for a people for his own possession in this moral sense has been clearly indicated from the beginning of the revelation of his will. His people are not racially determined, are not simply card-carrying members of some party or some religious group, but are a kind or quality of people. They certainly are not gods, they're not perfect, but they have escaped the corruption that is in the world through provisions that God made for true believers to partake of the divine nature, 2 Peter 1, verses 1 through 4. Now we stop and we think for just a moment that God has provided us through inspired literature that we know as the scriptures or the Bible, and he has revealed to us the unfolding of his plans for his creation, his eternal purpose, promise, prophecies found in the Old Testament, the preparation and perfection of the Christian dispensation, folks, these are all revealed in the New Testament. And what we hope to see as we continue through this study looking at the people of God is to trace the unfolding of God's purpose and his plan for the development of his people. Treating man as a free moral agent, hence responsible and accountable for his actions, Man's transgression of God's will is sin, but man also has the capacity and is held accountable for a trusting faith in the power of God. 
God does for man what man cannot do for himself, and on the condition of obedient, wholehearted faith, God provides the means of escape from sin. In Jesus Christ, sins are forgiven, and we can become one of God's people, and we can have the great promise of an eternal home in heaven. Friends, we thank you for joining us for our program today, and have a blessed day.